ocean waters, which are warming, and the atmosphere as well. Uh, this rate of warming that we have today uh, it may sound outlandish, but it's equivalent to exploding one nuclear uh, Hiroshima bomb every second of the day in the atmosphere. That's the added energy to the system because of increasing greenhouse gases, which are trapping in the sun's energy and causing the warming of the oceans and the, and the earth. So this is a huge amount of energy needed to cause the earth's temperature to go up by one, two, three degrees. And this is also what's driving all the severe weather that we're seeing and the strange weather around the planet. We'll talk about a little bit later. Now, where is, it, where is this warming happening around the world? So here we can see the spatial distribution for uh, the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s, the 2010s. What we're seeing here is actually the difference between normal. So it's what the delta. So the numbers here you can see are uh, plus minus. We've got uh, the, in the blues are negative numbers, in the yellows and reds positive. So areas which are blue are actually colder than this reference period, period at the bottom, 1951 to 80. And the oranges and the reds are warmer. And again, we can see going from the 80s to the 90s, uh, each decade, the 2000s, 2010s, we're seeing more and more yellow and orange and reds um, and less and less whites and blues, implying that, again, the whole globe is getting warmer. But it's important to note that even in the last decade, as shown down here from 2010 to 2019, we can see this little blue patch down here and some of these white areas, which imply there were some areas for the whole decade that were cooler than the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. But that doesn't mean there's no global warming. When we talk about global warming, we're talking about the globe, the whole planet. And so if we have a very, very cold winter in the UK this year, or in the US uh, the previous year, this is, doesn't mean that global warming isn't continuing because again, we're talking about the planet, planetary warming and we're gonna have fluctuations all over the place, but we can see with the trends are that we're getting more and more places warming and the warming is amplifying with time. Another interesting thing we can see here is that actually in the North Pole, in the Arctic area, in the high latitudes, we see more warming than in other areas of the planet, also down in Antarctica. And we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but the warming isn't equal around the planet. In the, in the polar regions, uh, the little number here in the top right tells you what the warming was relative to the 1950s, 60s for this decade, so 0 0.81 degrees, 0.38 degrees. But up here in the, in the Arctic, the red is above two degrees. So we're talking about more than double the, war the global warming is seen in the, in the Arctic region. So each region is warm, warming slightly different. And uh, here's a, a nice, oh, so if we want to uh, talk about the globe, some people say, well, maybe the, the measurements of global warming are because we're looking ready, we're measuring in our cities, our cities are growing over time, maybe they're measuring at airports. And so this is more an urban effect of expanding cities more cement more roads which actually absorb heat well to answer that we can look at the oceans so here on the top left we have the we have the time is here the x-axis is basically going over the 20th century 1900 1920s 40s 60s to 2000 uh, the y-axis are the latitudes so from 40 50 south to 60 north the atlantic ocean the top left the middle left is the indian ocean and the Pacific Ocean below. And again, the colors represent the changes in temperature relative to the 1950s, 60s, 70s. So uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, things were cooler in the oceans, the blue colors, but we can see the trend of getting warmer and warmer and becoming more and more positive at all latitudes and in all oceans. And so the oceans are also dramatically warming. Nobody lives there, so we can't blame it on urban heat islands or, or cities. Um, and this is truly a global phenomenon that uh, the oceans are warming. In fact, the oceans are trapping in most of the energy in the system. But maybe 90% of the heat is actually being stored in the oceans. The oceans are warming um, and the atmosphere may be only 10% of the warming that we see. Um, this is a nice movie which shows you different countries of the world how they've warmed, you can see the year on the top, 1910, 1915, relative again to this reference period, 1951 to 80. 
And you can see that uh, in this reference period, which was now in the 50s, you get some reds, some, some blues. The blues show cooler than normal. The, the oranges and reds show warmer than normal. And as we go into the 1980s, 1990s, the 2000s, start to see more and more reds and oranges. And this will end in 2017, where basically all every country in the world is warmer than normal. Israel is over here, which is 1.1 degree warmer than uh, it was in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So you can see each country is slightly different, but there's no country in the world which is cooling today relative to the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And if we don't believe the data, we can simply go and look out the window and look at not maybe in Israel and maybe not in the UK, but if we look at the, the Alps um, and the mountain glaciers, the difference is pictures the same location from 1961 to 2003. This glacier and ice has disappeared. Here in Patagonia and Argentina, we can see 1928 compared with 2004. This huge ice sheet is also melted, leaving a lake and just the edge of the, the glacier over here. Alaska, same location, 1909 to compared with 2004. This big glacier is gone. And another one, I think, from the Alps, showing this glacier, 1941 and 2004. You can see this white line here, which represented the height of this ice sheet, which has melted and left just the, the edge of it over here. Maybe uh, 95, if not 99% of all the mountain glaciers around the world are receding, are getting smaller. Um, and the only way we can explain this is because the temperature in the atmosphere is getting warmer. Now, if we go to the North Pole, um, the difference between the North Pole and the South Pole is that in the North Pole, we don't have any land. We only have oceans, but the oceans are covered in ice. So we have sea ice, which is floating on the oceans. In the South Pole in Antarctica, we only have land. We have mountains, we have rocks, rocky continent, which is covered also in ice. But this results in very different climates. It's much colder, actually, in Antarctica and much higher as well above sea level than it is in the Arctic. But if we look at the, in the Arctic, again, nobody lives there. So we have data from satellites which have been going over the pole every day since 1979. And we can actually calculate the area coverage of the sea ice in, the, in, the, in a specific uh, month. So this is for September at the end of the summer after we've had the summer melt. And what we see is this is given in millions of square kilometers that this is decreasing dramatically just from images from satellites. So in, the, in 1980, we were around about seven, seven and a half million square kilometers in, in September. And we can see we're maybe uh, half of that now. And this is uh, not updated until 2020. Um, the forecasts are, the, and the, the ice does grow back in the winter when it gets cold, but every, when, every summer we're seeing less and less coverage. Um, the ice is getting thinner and thinner. And the predictions are maybe by 2050 in the summer, the North Pole will not be covered with ice. Um, why is this a, a big deal? Well, because if we look at the map where we have the ice, um, if this is the coverage of the red line in the extent of the summer ice in, in the average of 1979 to 2000, this is the situation in, in, 19, in 2007 and 2012. What happens when the ice melts in the summer, we expose the very dark ocean underneath it and land as well if it's over the land. And this results like a black shirt. It absorbs more solar radiation in the summer, warms up the ocean more, can melt more ice, can expose more dark, dark ocean. And we get this runaway effect where we get more and more warming accelerating in the North Pole. And this is why we think we're seeing this enhanced warming in the high latitudes because of the melting of the ice, both over the ocean and over the lands. When we look, I should point out that this ice over the Arctic is ice again on top of the ocean. And it's, so it's floating in the ocean and therefore similar to your ice cube in your drink, in your whiskey, um, the level of your drink doesn't change uh, whether this is ice or whether it melts and changes into water. So the melting of the Arctic sea ice does not change sea level around the world, but it does have a large impact on the temperatures and the radiation which is absorbed by the sunlight in the ocean and hence causing more melting. 
On the other hand, we have two very large ice sheets which are on the land, one in Greenland and one in Antarctica. And these two are, are decreasing dramatically in their extent and in their thickness. And this has actually been monitored by this very clever satellite, actually two satellites which are, are flying in tandem called GRACE. And this is actually, a, it was originally uh, launched to measure the gravity field of the Earth. And as you may know, gravity depends on the mass underneath the satellite. So gravity is the pull between two different masses. One mass is the Earth and the other one is the satellite. And so we can map out actually mountains and valleys and different ch changes in mass in the Earth underneath these satellites. But then they discover that if the ice sheets are melting, they're losing mass. And so we can actually convert the gravity into changes in mass over time. So after the launch in 2002, we can see here the loss in billions of tons of water, which have been lost from the Greenland ice sheets, which will keep going down about 286 billion tons every year of water, which are melting, changing from ice to water, and then are flowing basically to the oceans and causing sea level rise. Similar in Antarctica, we're seeing a dramatic drop in the amount of ice. I should point out that the thickness of the ice in, in the Greenland is about three kilometers thick and in Antarctica about four kilometers in the center of the South Pole so there's a lot of ice there. If all that ice had to melt, which hopefully it won't melt uh, and will take a very long time, thousands if not longer, thousands of years, uh, but there's enough water on the land to cause all of the sea level around the whole planet to go up by 70 meters. 70 meters would basically submerge all the cities around the world but we don't expect that to happen. Um, the estimates today are that by the end of the century, uh, it's likely to be one meter, but I'll show you in a few minutes that even one meter can be significant for some countries. This is what it looks like in Greenland. If you go there in the summer, all of this is ice. You can see some people standing here and you get these melt ponds, which basically drill these waterfalls through the ice and they can go for two kilometers, the waterfall down to the bedrock and then flow to the ocean. And again, any of the ice which melts and, and basically flows into the ocean, these, this melting does have a direct effect on sea level rise. So we also have satellites now which can actually measure the sea level rise. They actually send, it's like a radar, they send a beam out like the cops who try to check your speed when you're driving past them. They send a beam which reflects off your car. Well, here we send a beam down to reflect off the ocean and we, we calculate the time that it comes back. And so after many, many measurements, we can actually calculate the height of the ocean surface above a certain reference level. And here you can see again from the 1990s, the increase in sea level globally. Um, and the different colors are just different satellites because the satellite has a lifetime of five or six years. And then we have to put a new one up there. And the slope of this curve is, seems quite small. It's only three millimeters per year, the rise in sea level but that means it's three centimeters every decade and you can extrapolate out to the future to say a hundred years. Um, most of the rise in sea level actually until today is because of the warming of the oceans, which simply take up a larger volume, warm water expands, but from now onwards, it's likely that a big part will be also the melting of the ice sheets. So what's causing this warming? So we need to talk a little bit about, um, about the greenhouse effect. So you've probably heard about the greenhouse effect. It's not the, an ideal comparison, but in a greenhouse, we have basically uh, a structure which has got windows either made out of glass or plastic, which allow most of the sunlight to come in. But the heat, which is then generated inside, uh, doesn't manage, doesn't leave very easily unless we open the windows. And therefore, it heats up inside. You may also have noticed if you park your car outside in a shopping mall on a cold, wintry day, but a sunny day, when you come back to the car, it's nice and warm inside. That's also the greenhouse effect. Well, in the Earth's atmosphere, the Earth has an atmosphere, and the atmosphere acts kind of like the windows of the greenhouse. Let's the sunlight come in, um, but the heat, which is given off by the Earth, uh, some of this gets trapped in. Some of it does go out to, to space, but some of it gets trapped inside, warming us up. We can think of the atmosphere as a blanket. We're putting blankets on the Earth to warm us up. And in fact, this occurs naturally, and it's not really all the atmosphere, it's specifically uh, water vapor. 
H2O. Water vapor um, is only about 1% of the gas in the room at the moment or in the atmosphere. But this results in warming the earth from maybe minus 18 degrees without the atmosphere, which would have been a frozen earth with solid frozen uh, oceans, to plus 15 degrees, so 33 degree warming just by the water vapor in our atmosphere. And this results in liquid water, liquid oceans, water we can drink, and life which developed on this planet. So the greenhouse effect is, first of all, it's good. It's good we have a natural greenhouse effect due to basically due to water vapor. Unfortunately, now we're adding more and more of these greenhouse gases, and we call them greenhouse gases because they act like the windows of the greenhouse. And these greenhouse gases are not natural. Carbon dioxide, they can be, but we're adding lots of them. Carbon dioxide is the main one that most people talk about, CO2. But methane is also a strong greenhouse gas. The CFCs or HCFCs today, which are used in our um, refrigerators and in our air conditioners, uh, ozone, nitrous oxide. So there are a whole suite of gases which we're emitting into the atmosphere. And you can see some of the trends here in the last few decades of these the concentrations going up. And we know that many of our activities on our day-to-day -day activities are producing these gases, whether it's the production of electricity for our homes, for our transportation, um, energy to drive our cars, our buses, production of our food, agriculture, Everything we do really needs energy. And this, as a result, through our power plants in different countries around the world, the food we have to produce, um, our flights uh, around the planet, all of these are now increasing the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And we can think of it as it's basically either closing the window on our greenhouse or adding a few more blankets to the earth. So who are the main culprits? So the main 50% of the problem comes from basically the burning of fossil fuel. Fossil fuel, whether it's coal or natural gas or oil, all of these are used basically to drive our economies. Our electricity comes from them, mainly uh, our cars. We put uh, petrol in our cars to drive them, um, our aircraft. So everything is basically our, our economies are running on fossil fuels. And fossils, basically fossil fuels mean they came from fossils, which are basically organic matter, whether they were plants or animals, which are made up of carbon. So when we, when we burn them, the carbon and the oxygen in the atmosphere produce carbon dioxide um, and some other gases. Agriculture, we got to feed the planet. And this is a big problem because uh, agriculture, we have to firstly, we have to have a lot of area to grow the food. We need to ha have lots of fertilizers the fertilizers are rich in nitrogen, which also react with oxygen to produce one of the greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide. Um, but other, other um, agricultural yields like rice, for example, we have lots of Indians and Chinese who eat rice every day. And rice itself, growing the rice, produces methane gas. Obviously, eating beef and hamburgers and steaks, we need to have cows which grow. They use a huge amount of resources, water and food, but they also release lots of methane, and these are all contributing to the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, deforestation is an interesting one, and there was a lot of discussion about this in Glasgow, because uh, for plants naturally uh, take up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and trap it in the wood, in the leaves, in their roots. But if you chop down these forests and you also burn them, then you're releasing all this carbon back into the atmosphere. And so, deforestation in developing countries is having maybe 15, 20% of the problem of climate change. And then we have industrial chemi chemicals like this, the CFCs or the HCFCs today, which we use in air conditions in industry, which also have a heat trapping cap capability. So when they get released into the atmosphere, they actually are like a blanket and, and warm up the atmosphere as well. So if we look at our use of our basic use of energy, our consumption of energy around the world, we can see at 50,000 terawatt hours. Um, again, the oil, coal, gas keep going up because the population keep going up. Our economies are growing. China is growing dramatically over the last two decades. And if we look down here, it's uh, not very uh, optimistic looking at where we have solar, wind, even nuclear, hydropower, the other non-polluting uh, sources of energy when we're talking about um, the climate. 
So if we look at some of these individual gases, carbon dioxide, uh, mainly coming again from the production of energy, um, this up and down sawtooth pattern is actually the breathing of the planet, the vegetation, which when it grows in the spring, it takes up carbon dioxide. So we go down, we have a minimum. And at the end of the spring and in the fall, when things start to decay, the leaves fall off the tree, then the carbon dioxide goes back into the atmosphere. So the red up and downs are a natural cycle, but the blue line shows the overall increase, which is happening over time. And basically this is showing that we're having this increase in the overall carbon dioxide, and we can only explain this by human activity. I mentioned the deforestation. So here you can see a satellite image on the right uh, from 1975, 86, 2005 of the Amazon rainforest. Uh, there, it's an artificial color, but there, as, as soon as they built a road into the jungles, uh, people had access and they started to clear the forest for um, subsistence agriculture. And you can see some more roads were built. The lighter bluish colors are all the areas which are free of forests, which are basically cut down for agriculture, for subsistence agriculture, or for pastures, for cows. Uh, and this is what it looks like on the ground. Not only do they chop down the forest, but it's much easier for them to burn the forest to get rid of the, the, the wood and the, and the biomass than to pay someone to maybe remove it. And uh, the less vegetation we have in the tropical rainforests, the more we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's as simple as that. So as we have less and less vegetation on the planet, it means also a contribution of carbon dioxide and a contribution to the, the global warming. In the 1940s, 50s, uh, the burning of fossil fuel and this effect of the changing of the biosphere were more or less equal. But since then, the burning of fossil fuel, the red curve has taken off and is maybe about 80% of the problem today. But still 20% of the problem, 20, 30% is due to what's happening in tropical countries in Brazil, Indonesia, the Congo. And one of the big agreements or uh, declarations in Glasgow was to try to stop this phenomenon by 2030. And even Brazil signed on to this, although again, they need money from the West to help them do this. A lot of the deforestation is because of poverty. They need work for their people. They need uh, to give people jobs. And uh, farming is the easiest way to allow people to, to earn a living, but at the, at the, at the uh, damage of the, of the forests. The next greenhouse gas of importance is, is methane and uh, CH4. Methane is basically very well correlated with the number of people on the planets. The more people we have living on the planet, the more methane is in the atmosphere. And again, there are a number of sources. One of them is growing rice. So lots of rice grown around the planet, but also beef, um, but also fires. In fact, we can see here different sources, the natural sources. So any place where we don't have enough oxygen to react with the materials under the ground, the organic matter, uh, what we call a reduced environment or a non-oxidized environment, we can get methane. So wetlands or swamps or bogs, uh, even termites can produce naturally uh, methane, but we have many more anthropogenic influences and sources of methane from cows and livestock to rice paddies, biomass burning, landfills, coal mining. In fact, recently people think that the leaking leaking of pipelines gas pipelines around the world in alaska and siberia are also becoming a major problem for the increasing methane in the atmosphere and that could be an easy solution just to basically seal those pipes and to keep the, the methane in the pipes which will also be good for the companies they'll be saving money at the bottom we can see how the production and consumption of rice basically go together and the same with the world cattle population and the consumption of beef the more we eat beef, the more the more cows are going to be grown. Um, and so if we stop eating beef, there won't be a market for them. And in fact, we in the Western world are part of the problem. Uh, we can't blame Brazil for growing so many cows. They don't eat the cows. They ship them out to the West, to Europe and to the UK and to the US and the other countries who want these hamburgers and the steaks. Uh, if people don't demand those steaks, the cows won't be grown. Agriculture, the next gas, which is important in this uh, nitrous oxide, this is also the laughing gas that some of you may get at the dentist, but this is formed uh, due to fertilizers. And again, we have to feel, 
feed more than 7 billion people on the planet. So there's a lot of agriculture, a lot of fertilizers, and this also causes the rise in this gas called nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And the CFCs or HCFCs, which uh, are completely unnatural, they don't occur in nature. We made them in the 1920s to solve the problem of refrigeration. Uh, initially, we thought it was the perfect solution. And then in the 1980s, we realized this is destroying the ozone layer, and we had to do something about that. But we still need refrigeration and air conditioning, so they found some alternative which is now called the HCFC, is less damaging to the ozone layer, but it still traps in the heat in, a, in our house for our air conditioning. <clears throat> so when these gases are released into the atmosphere, when people throw away their fridges or the air conditioning, um, this then traps in the Earth's heat and causes extra global warming. <clears throat> so how do we know this is really, it's just not a natural cycle. I've shown you only data for say 100, 150 years, but uh, maybe this is just a natural fluctuation of the climate, the natural variability. So we have to go and look back further. And to do that, we really can only do this by using what we call proxies, which are something we don't have. The, the thermometer was only invented a few hundred years ago, so we can't go back and measure the temperature <coughs> more than a few hundred years ago. And so we need proxies. And one of them that I'll show you here is, is the ice cores which are drilled into the ice sheets. And as I mentioned, Antarctica is about four kilometers thick ice. How does the ice form? Well, the snow falls down out of the sky. And when the snow gets to about 150 meters thickness, it's heavy enough to compact the ice and the snow underneath it and eventually forms ice. Now, what's nice about ice is when it forms, it traps in the bubbles of air that were in the air at the time that it formed, the same as the ice that you've put in your refrigerator you have bubbles of air inside there. Well, if the ice formed 100,000 years ago, then we can easily, we can carefully open up those bubbles and check what was in the atmosphere 100,000 years ago and get some information about the, the, the pollution or the gases in the atmosphere. We also have ways of looking at the temperature even relative today by using various chemical isotopes, which I'm not going to go into, but we have methods of even getting a relative temperature hundreds of thousands of years ago. So here we can see uh, 2000 years of data looking at the little bubbles. You can see these little white dots inside the slice of ice here from Antarctica. We can see inside these little bubbles, the concentration of carbon dioxide in red, methane in blue, nitrous oxide in black. And what we see is they, the scales are different, but they were more or less stable for nearly 2000 years. And then something happened around 1850, 17, 50 to 1850, and all of them took off, started going up, and they haven't stopped yet. Um, we can go 10,000 years back. So here we have the zero is today. Let's go 10,000 back, 10,000 years back in time, looking at these little bubbles in the in the ice core. On the top, we can see carbon dioxide, which has gone up. We can just see it was all of these were fairly stable. The different colors or different places where we get the data, different ice cores but a fairly stable over 10,000 years, and then a boom, it just goes up by nearly 40%. The methane was also fairly stable, and then a nearly 200% increase over, say, 200 years, and nitrous oxide as well. Nothing natural happened on planet Earth that we know of at this period to cause this dramatic increase. If you speak to climate deniers or skeptics, nobody can tell you why we had such a dramatic increase in greenhouse gases naturally. Nothing happened in the sun, in the oceans, no volcanoes. Uh, we don't, nothing we can find and document it. People were around, we know we've got uh, reports, nothing natural happened. The only thing that happened that I'm sure you all know is the industrial revolution. Industrial revolution, we started to burn coal in our steam engines. We started to have uh, technologies we were living longer, the population started to increase dramatically. Uh, we could farm for the whole city, not just for our family. And basically using energy took off. And this is what caused the start of this massive increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so putting in this perspective of 10,000 years, and I'll come back, remember the 10,000 years, I'll come back to this at the end of the talk. So we can also look at temperatures going back in time. So this is also 2,000 years. This is the last data point here was uh, two, 2016. 
um, but just uh, from 1901 to there it was a half a degree warming. We can see in the last 2000 years, the temperature hasn't really varied more than about 0.2 degrees about this mean temperature. And again, since about 1850, things are just taken off. And the, the darker curve is what I showed you in the first plot today. <clears throat> the goal of the, the Paris 2015 uh, COP meeting, which is one of the previous meetings from Glasgow, was not to pass this threshold of 1.5 or 2 degrees, actually. Actually, Glasgow now, the, the statement out of Glasgow is we need to try to keep ourselves below this 1.5. It's going to be really difficult, I think. I doubt uh, we're going to make it, but th this is the kind of goal in sight. How do we prevent ourselves from crossing this line um, and getting a, this basically a, a fever of 1.5 degrees? I'll, come, I'll explain that afterwards. This data, again, we don't have thermometers back this far, so we have to use things like tree rings or pollen deposits, ice cores again, or even corals, uh, data from corals to get estimates of what the temperature was in the past. We can go back 420,000 years. So this is again data from the ice cores. Now we can see carbon dioxide, methane, and the temperature in red. This is relative temperature. So zero is today's temperature over here. And what we see is all three of these plots show a periodicity, ups and downs, which are kind of in, uh, in sync. And these are the ice ages we've had on the earth. The last ice age we had was about 20,000 years ago. Half of the UK was under an ice sheet. And the whole of Scandinavia, parts of Europe, the whole of Canada, down to the Great Lakes were under an ice sheet. The sea level went down 100 meters because we had so much ice on the land. So 20,000 years ago, uh, it was about four degrees colder than today. At the beginning of the talk, I said we could be four degrees warmer than today. But in just 100 years, the change from this ice age to today took 10,000 years, or maybe a little bit less. For thousands of years, this warming. So what we're seeing today is truly uh, anomalous. And if we put this in perspective, this is what's happening today, although the scale here is very different. We're talking about here 150 years, where every tick here is 10,000 years. But to put it in perspective, we can see that methane, basically, on the same scale, is off the charts. Uh, in the last uh, 420,000 years, the highest value of methane was 8 ton. And we're somewhere up here at 1,800. And if we look at carbon dioxide, the highest values were about 300, 300 of these units, and we're now already at 420. Ah, and here we can put in uh, 800 years, 800,000 years of data from the ice cores in Antarctica. And here we're just looking at uh, carbon dioxide in red, and sorry, in blue, and the methane in red without the temperature. But here too, we can see these glacial cycles, the low, the minimum are when we had ice ages on, on planet Earth. The warm period we call interglaciers. And it's also important to note that there have been periods, and I'll go back to this one, which have been warmer on planet Earth. So this, these peaks over here, we are actually warmer than we are today. The big difference is there weren't 8 billion people on the planet that we had to feed and we had to take care of. So it, the, planet Earth doesn't really care too much if it gets a little hotter, it gets a little colder. Planet Earth will be here. The problem is us, that we have basically uh, got 8 billion people on the planet. We've built our infrastructures, our cities, our countries, uh, basically under a constant climate. And this is now starting to change dramatically. So again, what's the problem? The basic problem is we've got too many people on the planet. And they're incre the number of people are increasing so fast that we can't keep up with this. And we're overusing our resources on the planet. Uh, and therefore, it's becoming unsustainable. Here we can see for the last 10,000 years, the Earth, the world's population, it's always been below uh, maybe half a billion people. And just in the last 200 years, we went from half a billion to more than 7 billion people. We're now close to 8 billion, and things keep on going up. If we see what's predicted for the future, so from 1990s to 2130 or more, um, depending on what happens with the various uh, scenarios of the United Nations, and these numbers re represent the fertility rate, how many children we will have uh, for every woman on the planet. So if we can get to the target of 2.1, then maybe we'll maximize around about 10 billion around about the end of the century, and then it may start to decrease. 
if we're opt very optimistic and we can get to by the middle of the century by 2050 to 1.7 i think we're uh 2.3 at the moment um then we'll start to see 2050 a decrease in population and if it if we miss that if we're pessimistic and it gets to 2.5 by 2050 then things just keep on going and we could have uh, 20 billion people here by the end of the century all these people need to be fed all these people will want to have energy electricity and as the standard of living increases they'll want to have cars and they'll want to travel uh, and so the future population is is a big problem so what's the forecast for the future uh, how could we forecast the climate in 2050 if I can't really forecast the weather next week? Well, the climate is the average situation in the, of the weather. So the weather is basically the noise. It's very difficult to predict the noise in a system, but the average, the mean, is easier. So I can predict, for example, in Israel that in August, in August 2026, we will not have any rain in Israel. And that's a fairly good forecast because that's the climate. But I cannot tell you what the weather is going to be on the 5th of August, what the temperature will be. So we try to do the same with these big computer models, extremely complicated computer models, which we try to simulate everything happening in the atmosphere, whether it's clouds, rain, uh, interaction of sunlight with the greenhouse gases, with particles, the surface, whether we have vegetation, types of vegetation, whether that's covered in ice or snow. In the oceans, we have ocean currents, which transport heat and and moisture by evaporation. We have sea ice, we have land ice, extremely complicated. And if we want to predict what will happen in the future, this takes a huge amount of computer power. And therefore, there are only maybe 30 groups around the world, including the UK Met Office, uh, that have these extremely uh, complicated and uh, computer intensive uh, models. But we use these in the IPCC report that I mentioned, and the last one came out in August. And these then can give us various scenarios into the future. And these scenarios depend on what we're going to do, what our politicians are going to do, uh, whether we're going to move to renewable energies, if we're going to stay with coal, if we're going to move to natural gas, um, and if we're going to just continue business as usual, which is normally the, the higher option here. And again, the, the, the Glasgow Agreement says we should try to get to not pass as 1.5 and definitely not pass the two. This would be a very low emission scenario where we really move dramatically to renewable energies. Um, so this is also, uh, I think, a little bit too optimistic, but we'll be somewhere in the, in the middle here, talking about two to three degrees maybe by the end of the century. Won't stop there unless we do something, it'll just keep on going. But it could possibly, some of the models predict, it could be four degrees, four and a half degrees by the end of the century. And I'll remind you that that's how much the change was in the last ice age in the other direction. Uh, minus four degrees, the earth basically had ice sheets all over Canada. New York City was under two kilometers of ice. The, uh, the oceans went down 100 meters. And now we're talking about four degrees in the other direction. And so you can just imagine what will happen to the climate and how it will impact us if that does actually happen. Now, again, uh, one or two degrees may not seem a lot to people, but we have to look at the distribution of the weather. Again, we say that the, the climate is the average. So if we take this as the temperature in London, we have an average temperature throughout the year, but we have cold days and we also have warm days in the, in the summer. You have a distribution. But if we shift this just a few degrees to, the, to warmer temperatures, then what happens is we sometimes may not feel this mean, but we feel the very warm days which should be a lot more frequent than normal and then we have the heat waves with the days which are we just didn't have in the past and uh, so this is what's going to happen uh, with temperatures we're going to see more heat waves but we could also have changes in the shape of this so we could actually with rainfall we expect to get both drier periods and warmer periods uh, but we see the temperature changes is occurring so this is data looking at the temperatures around the planet, put on this kind of distribution, 100 years apart. So the blue curves are for the different months of the year, for 1881 to 1910. And the orange uh, curves are for eight, 1981 to 2010, relative again to this reference, 1950s, 60s and 70s. So we see that the temperatures around the whole planet have been shifting by about one degree 
in all the different seasons. And the shape has also been changing. The shape of these curves have been changing. Some of them are becoming broader. And in the last few years, you can see 2016, 17, these are the average world temperatures. We can see we're all the way out on the right-hand side of these distributions, breaking the records nearly every year, the world temperatures. So things are definitely changed over the last 100 years. And we keep changing, and we keep going in, in the wrong direction. Some of you may remember the heat wave in Europe. And so again, a few degrees warming, you can see the impacts on, on people's lives. This is the distribution of temperature in Switzerland from 1863 to 2003. Every line is one year. A nice average summer temperature around about 17 degrees. That's nice and cool, very cool in Israel. And it's probably cool even in, in the UK for the summer. And this is what happened, the average temperature in 2003 a five and a half degree warming of the average, but still 22 and a half degrees is nice, uh, nice uh, average temperature for the summer. But because of the shift, the tail of the distribution also increased. And as a result in Europe, there were more than 70,000 deaths in a 10 day period, 11 day period, mainly in France, UK as well, Spain. Um, this also hit in the middle of August when in, especially in, in uh, in France, a lot of the doctors are on vacation, so there weren't enough uh, staff in hospitals. Uh, many elderly and young people with respiratory diseases and, and, and problems and weak, weaker, maybe, uh, um, I wouldn't say immune system, but more susceptible to the heat, especially the heat at night when it doesn't cool down, uh, were the ones that died. And how do we know this? Because we can look for those exactly the same 10 days the year before and the year afterwards, and there were 70,000 less people that died in those 10 days. And so this, this increase of a few degrees in the mean can have a huge implications on a hu human population. The models also produce changes in rainfall in the future. So this is a forecast of many models by the end of the century, 2099. And we can see here that we have a mixed bag. The blues show we actually have decreases in rainfall up to about 20%. And the blues show an increase, including parts of the, of the UK, but it depends on the season. The left is a December, January, February, winter. The right's are June, July, August. And the dots we see here is where 90% of the models agree with each other, where we have a lot more confidence. So the Middle East, the Mediterranean is expected to dry out significantly. And we're starting to see this. Um, and this kind of also when you have drying out and droughts, not only heat waves, but you also have fires. So fires in Portugal and Spain and Greece, even in Israel are increasing, especially in the intensity of those fires. We're seeing similar in California, in Australia, and in other parts of the world, we're seeing basically droughts, uh, floods have occurring. So California has also been in a long drought. You can see the lake levels of, of dramatically lower, and Pakistan, you know, on the other hand, is getting lots of floods. Um, Europe too, we saw the floods in, in Germany earlier this year. So the, the hydrological cycle, the weather is going to become more extreme. On the one side, drier and more droughts, heat waves, fires. On the other side, more rain, intense storms, and more flooding. The third thing that the models predict is the increase in sea level. And uh, the models predict, uh, depending on which report, up to about one meter, 100 centimeters by the end of the century. And just to show uh, how the models predicted this, uh, in 1990, when we had the first report of the IPCC, here we can see 1990, the forecast of sea level rise, this gray area by 2010. Well, when we got to 2010, we could look back and see what actually happened. And the blue line are the actual data points, which actually show that the models were kind of underestimating this uh, sea level rise. It's on the upper boundary. And so while some people say, well, maybe the scientists are overestimating and uh, they, they cry. They're saying that things are going to happen and they're over energetic about everything. Well, maybe we're under, underestimating what could happen in the future, like with that four degrees. Maybe it'll be six degrees by the end. Of the so it could go both directions. What could a one degree, half a degree do, do to countries like Egypt? So if here we can see the Nile Delta with a half a meter rise in sea level and a one meter. One meter sea level rise, Alexandria, Port Said, 6.1 million people will have to leave their homes and move. They'll be underwater. Now, this won't happen overnight, but people will have to be relocated. You have to basically move people. That's also agricultural land. And this could be a big problem for what we call climate refugees, that they don't have a place to live. They're going to move looking for new homes. 
And uh, this is also the case in Bangladesh and other low-lying countries. And this is something which we're going to see more of in the future as sea level rises. So changes in temperature, warming temperatures, changes in rainfall and changes and rising sea level have implications in all different areas of our life from health, when we talk about malaria and tropical diseases, uh, but even pandemics that we're seeing now with the COVID may increase because of climate change, because of the destruction of habitats, of exotic species in the tropics, which need to find new places to live, or maybe too warm. And then they will be coming in touch with livestock, cows, pigs, which eventually we eat. So pandemics are also some, could be related to climate change. Agriculture, obviously, droughts and pests, forest fires, forest health um, are related to these parameters. Water resources, especially in the Middle East, the quality, the amount of water, the seasonality. When do we get the rain? Do we get it in the growing season? Do we not? Does it come down as downpours or do we get it gently over the season? Coastal areas, obviously, erosion because of sea level rise. And obviously, biodiversity um, is going to be impacted by all of these changes. So again, I wanted to come back to this 10,000 year time scale. This was the last ice age 20,000 years ago. The last 10,000 years of what we call the Holocene. The Holocene is a geological era where basically all of our civilizations developed from the Romans, the Egyptians, the Greeks, uh, everyone, every civilization developed and fell during this period where the climate was very stable. When I mean stable, we had ups and downs, but about 0.5 degree variability, but the sea level was constant. Uh, rainfall patterns were more or less constant. And therefore we could develop our countries, our cities, our infrastructures um, based on this very constant climate. But we're now leaving this period and we don't really know, we're doing an experiment with the earth going up. And as I mentioned, it could be up to four and a half degrees in 100 years. The scales here are very different now. Uh, we're talking about here yeah, hundreds of thousands of years. This is 100 years. And again, this the rise that we are predicting for the next 100 years could be similar to this rise we saw from the last ice age over 20,000 years, over 10,000 years, sorry. So this could be very dramatic with huge implication. So this all sounds very gloomy. Are there solutions? Well, Glasgow was to talk about solutions. And this is a simple plot which I like to use showing <clears throat> how we can solve this problem. If we think of the, this y-axis is the cost to you and to me uh, for our energy bill every month. How much do we pay for electricity at home? How much do we pay to put the petrol in the car? How much of our food costs go to pay for the energy to transport them, to produce them? Today, we're using mainly fossil fuels, the blue curve. And if we look at where we are now, it's still cheaper to use fossil fuels than to use renewables, the green curve. But with time, and, and on purpose, there are no dates here, with time, the resources-based energy is eventually going to run out. It may take hundreds of years, it may take thousands of years, but once it becomes rare, then the price goes up and people will have to pay more. On the other hand, renewables are based only on innovation, on our brains, which are basically infinite. And so... As we develop more and we invest more in renewable energies, in startup companies with new ideas, the prices are coming down dramatically. And when these two lines cross each other, we're basically on the way to solve the problem. Because why would I want to buy uh, or why would I want to pay for polluting expensive energy when I can have clean, cheaper energy? Why would I want to buy a car which runs on polluting petrol which is more expensive than an electric car, which is quiet and clean and using maybe solar energy in the grid. So once these lines cross, it's kind of game over. The question is, when are they going to cross? Are they going to cross in 10 years, in 50 years, in 100 years? And can we influence this? So we can influence this. We can increase the slope of the blue line by putting, say, extra levies, extra taxes on using fossil fuels. And we could give subsidies to people who want to use renewable energies and electric cars to bring the green line down. And this is part of the discussion in Glasgow and around the world, how we can do this to put the true price of fossil fuel, not just how much it costs to take it out of the ground and put it in our car or to burn it to produce electricity, but what's the cost on the environment? If we put that price in it, then the price should go up. And if we put the, the subsidies for the renewables, this will come down, bring this closer to the present. And things are happening dramatically. If we look at the price of solar energy and even wind, 
And this is what's called levelized costs, the cost of building and operating the power plant over its whole lifetime. So construction, development, the, the, the actual running cost. And just in 10 years, from the 2009-10, we've seen a dramatic drop in the cost of, of solar. It's now cheaper than uh, gas and coal and oil. Uh, we just need to now figure out how we can scale this up to a really global, global scale. And so this is very optimistic that we now have the technologies to actually do this. So what needs to be done? And this was basically the war cry that we heard at, uh, in Glasgow. We need to get to what's called net zero emissions. What is net zero? And we need to do this by 2050. So if we want to reach this 1.5 degree target, we, today we're emitting about 40 gigatons, 40 uh, billion tons of carbon dioxide every year into the atmosphere, and it keeps on going up. We need to bring this down and get to net zero, which means that we're not increasing anymore in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide or the equivalent carbon dioxide by 2050. And what we are putting in the atmosphere, we have to take out some other way, like planting trees or using some technology. So this is the goal now, to try to get by 2050 to net zero around the planet. So how do we get there? Well, the first thing we need to do is transform our electricity sector to clean energies. This is a huge task, and this is really a revolution. The Industrial Revolution 200 years ago gave us fossil fuels, helped us build our economies, our industries, and we've We've advanced light, light years with the fossil fuels. It did a lot of good things, but now we realize it's done a lot of bad, it's doing bad things now. So we need another uh, industrial revolution to move away from this and we have to go to clean electricity. Then we need to electrify all equipment that can be electrified, our cars, our trains, maybe even planes. We have to make them all electric and use the electricity, the clean electricity from the first point over here. At the moment, electric cars are plugging into the grid and using fossil fuel generated electricity. So that's not that good. Uh, eventually, we hope that though we'll be able to get in the, in, the, in the grid, in the wall of your house, you'll be able to plug in and this will be coming from solar or from wind or maybe even nuclear. Then we need to, some things cannot run on electricity. For example, ships crossing the ocean, you can't charge them every day or two. Uh, or even aircraft. So we need to also create synthetic fuels. So these are artificial fuels, but they act the same as the fuel we have now in the car. Um, and the main one talked about in Glasgow is, is hydrogen. Hydrogen we have in every molecule of water, H2O. We need to split that and we need energy for that, but we can use sun, the solar energy for that or wind energy and produce hydrogen, which can be used in shipping, also in heavy industry, like the steel industry, the cement industry. And uh, as we can also get this from biomass by growing algae in, in the oceans, or even uh, taking uh, crops, growing crops. As long as you grow the crops again, we can use those crops for energy. As we grow them again, they'll take up that same amount of carbon dioxide, store it inside the biomass. We can then burn it again or produce uh, ethanol. As long as we keep on having the cycle of uh, using and then regrowing. I mentioned there's some non-energy sectors we have to deal with, agriculture. We have to change the way we do agriculture, whether it's, uh, again, going to a uh, different type of agriculture, urban agriculture. Uh, today, we have startups even in Israel where we can grow steaks with the bone of the steak in a laboratory without killing a cow. We can take the stem cells and we can grow a steak. It tastes like beef, it is beef, it's not, it's not a, vegeta a vegetarian substitute, it's real meat, but we don't have to have cows. Can we scale it up to grow our hamburgers in laboratories? The same with milk. Our waste, waste is a big uh, source of, um, of methane. How do we deal with our waste? Just changing our consumption, how we buy things on the internet, how we fly so much. Uh, fashion industry is a big problem. We're changing our wardrobes every few months, especially the kids today, so easy to buy it online from China. And finally, some of the emissions that we're going to put into the atmosphere, we're not going to be able to stop completely by 2050. And therefore, we need to have technology which will remove these gases, especially the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, what we call carbon sequestration. Uh, naturally, this would be afforestation, growing more trees, growing more vegetation, maybe more seaweed in the, in the oceans, where through photosynthesis, they take out the carbon dioxide. But there are also technologies and there are pilots in Iceland, for example, 
where they're actually literally sucking out the carbon dioxide through filters in the atmosphere, like a big vacuum cleaner. And this is then converted to liquid, uh, liquid carbon dioxide, but also mixed with water. So you can think about making soda water and you pump this into the ground, deep into the ground, into the rocks, cavities in the rocks. And within a year or two, this will actually solidify into a rock. Like you have the cliffs of Dover. Those are made out of uh, basically, those are chalk from, from, uh, very, from, which is basically carbon dioxide, which was taken up by animals in the ocean, and but originally was carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we can fix this carbon dioxide for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. Can we do it? That's the big question. Can we do it by 2050? Well, um, I'd like to remind people about the talk exactly 60 years ago by President Kennedy, what they call the moonshot uh, um, talk, where he basically said in 1961, where they had no idea how they're going to do it, that before the decade was out, before the 1960s were out, the Americans are going to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. They had no idea how to do it, but this was basically the, the goal. And you all remember in July 1969, Neil Armstrong, one small step for man, one huge leap for mankind. They did it. And this was just one country and just one, one uh, institute, NASA. If we basically pull, get everyone in the world working together on this problem, I think it can be done. And uh, we have to be optimistic here. And I'd like to end with a quote from uh, Nelson, Mandela, Nelson Mandela, who said, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you very much. So I'll be happy to take questions if there are. Maybe Leonard can pick up on the questions. Um, thank you very much. I have, I have to say I have not heard as good a description uh, of what of what the issues are and how well presented they are. Let, let me start off with a question and then I'll then we'll go into I've got a, 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 some lining up one. Well, one of the one of the things that really worries me is the white line, the white bit that showed that uh, that the Atlantic has has uh, has not warmed up, and because the consequence of that is that the Gulf Stream. And there's issues that the Gulf Stream might go into into reverse, and that would actually transform the UK into a sort of Moscow type climate. Um, right. Uh, right. So, so there's a, there was even a movie made about that. You may have seen the, the Day After Tomorrow, which is a Hollywood movie where everything happened in two weeks. But basically, the the Gulf Stream. It's connected to what we call the ocean conveyor belt. So it takes the warm water up to Iceland, which then the air is warm and that affects the climate in the UK. You're basically on the same latitude as Canada, but your climate is very different. And because of the ocean, now because of the melting of the ice in Greenland and putting fresh water, sweet water into the ocean, this can affect that circulation. And some people think that this could either stop or reverse the circulation even. And if it stops, that means that actually global warming by melting the ice will actually cool the UK. But again, the planet will still continue warming, but the yes. UK could get much colder than it is today. So that we have sensors in the oceans, in the Atlantic all the time measuring this. And there's a big debate whether things are slowing down because these are very slow currents in the deep ocean. Talking about things can take a thousand years to do the whole uh, loop around, but uh, it could happen, and it may have happened in the past. We don't know. We don't have so much evidence, but uh, that would have maybe an impact on the UK and Europe. Uh, but it wouldn't. It may not. May have a warming effect somewhere else on the planet by not taking uh, yes. cold water somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Karen has a question. Karen, do you do you want to do you want to ask it? Um, unmute yourself. If not, I will ask ask it, uh, or I'll ask it on her on her behalf. Um, okay. Yeah, Karen, want, can you unmute yourself, Karen? If not, I. Her question is: If we change our behaviour. The consumption, etc., would the earth get cooler or would it stay in a status quo? 
No, so, well, so we have to work both bottom up, public is important, the behavior, and also top down, but definitely we can fix the, the situation. So basically, by changing our behavior and by moving to renewable energies, we'll eventually get to net zero, but then we want to get to negative, zero, negative uh, emissions so that we keep taking out more carbon dioxide and eventually return back to the climate we were decades ago. So we can definitely return back to what we were before if we take those greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. The only thing that we may be stuck with is sea level rise. That sea level, in order to reduce the sea levels, we first have to produce lots of snow and produce ice sheets, which take a long time. And for that, we also have to cool the climate. And so whatever the sea level rise we see, we may have to live with that. But the temperatures and the changes in rainfall, we can reverse that and go back to what we had before if we return to the levels of the greenhouse gases we had in the 50s, 60s, and before that. Thank you. Um, I do care, Karen, if you are there, if you want to. Uh, right, let's, we've got um, uh, some more questions. A question from Hugh Marco. Um, can you unmute, Hugh? You need to. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Video. Video. Right. Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Hugh. Oh, right. Hi <laughs> there. It's actually Hugh Marker's wife here, Anne. This has been absolutely fascinating. Um, just trying to think of, of things that we can individually do to, to, to help with this crisis. Um, to what extent is it helpful to become a vegan or at least vegetarian? Well, I, uh, I think uh, the biggest issue is really energy use uh, to have a, an impact. But uh, I don't know about vegan, but but having less beef. Beef is a big problem. I mean, beef and uh, uh, so some people want to become vegetarian. I don't like to tell people not to do something. I'd say maybe do a little bit less. So instead of having a hamburger every week, you can have it maybe once a month uh, or a steak. But uh, so vegan... Uh, um, it could help, but again, it helps only on the agricultural side. The biggest problem really is the energy, uh, use of energy, whether it's uh, for lighting our homes or our industries or our cars. And there, there are lots of small things we could do that if everyone did them, it wouldn't help. Uh, even simple things like turning off the light when you leave the room or hanging up your clothes to dry instead of using the clothes dryer if, if the sun's out or taking public transport instead of your car, flying less. If you can get somewhere in the UK by train or by car, it may be better than flying if it's not too far away. Um, the easiest thing for everyone really to make a big impact is to go out and vote and vote for leaders that will do something and who will change things. Um, that really doesn't cost us anything. And that's really the only way that things are really gonna change by changing the leadership in the world Hopefully Biden is a good step forward after Trump. Uh, even here in Israel, we have some positive sides uh, with Bennett and the new government, uh, the Minister of, Ministry, the Minister of uh, Environmental Protection and Energy and Transportation. They're all ladies, all females, and they're all uh, want to help the environment and change things. So, but on the other hand, we have the Chinese and the Russians and the Brazilian presidents who are not particularly on board. But leadership is definitely a key role. The European Union is really moving forward and kind of leading the way, I think. And so voting for the right people, whether it's locally in your municipality or nationally, can have a big impact. Um, when you go shopping, uh, if you buy fresh, fresh produce from the market, uh, instead of buying things which are frozen or packaged, uh, if they're frozen or packaged, they used energy. They had to be brought there, they had to be frozen. So if you can buy fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, that's also saving on energy, energy costs. Um, so there are many little things you can do when you go buy a new washing machine, make sure that it's on the most efficient level so that it saves energy in the long term. So there are many little things we could do to save energy. And again, with the diet, eating maybe less beef, um, getting a more efficient car, maybe electric car in the future. Uh, but eventually, we have to change. We have we need systematic change, which comes from the top down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Babs, uh, I'll ask you to to unmute. Uh, can you unmute? 
Yes. Can you unmute? Should press the blue. Yeah, just you, there you go. So. Nope, I've done the wrong thing. Wait a minute. I think you just hold the space bar down and we'll unmute. Yes, if you hold the space bar. Yeah, if you hold it, if you're not on an there iPad, you hold the space bar down. Yeah. Okay, we can hear you now. Yes. Um, well, uh, my question is about, yeah, you, you've talked a lot about we and about cars and what we can do with energy, but that relates to, to an adult and, uh, you know, to, to, to us adults. But I'm just wondering how you can drive young people coming through schools and, and colleges. And is there going to be careers in, in climate change? Because I, I still get very confused. I'm, you know, I'm still kind of, it's such a wide and big thing, climate change to me. And I know we can do things as adults and, and with families and, 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 and tell our children this, but what's going to drive young people to, to actually, um, you know, because they're going to be the driving force in the future to, to make these changes, how are they going to do it? And, yeah. and will there be careers for them in climate change? And, and, yeah, what's, well, and how well, are we I, going to do that? I think it's already happening. If you see the protests in Glasgow and Greta, uh, Thornburg from Sweden, things have taken off in the last five years, the younger generation and the kids, even in Israel here, they protest all the time, they're very much aware that their future is in danger. And so they're really uh, part of the debate and part of pushing the decision makers ahead. And I think brought a lot of the awareness in the in the press out. And so they're doing a great job. Um, I definitely think they're going to be completely new jobs in the future that don't even exist today, that we don't even know about, led to climate change. Just the whole renewable energy uh, sector going into whether solar or wind, these are going to expand dramatically in the future and going to need people, engineers, but uh, regulators. Um, businesses, for example, now there's what's called ESGs. Their businesses have to have some monitoring of their emissions and their greenhouse gases. So they need environmental consultants. They need every company is taking up new people, consultants. They don't have to be scientists. They just have to know how to do the calculations and to collect the information. Um, again, the transportation sector is going to be changing to electric. You have to put in infrastructures for charging electric vehicles. Then we have a startup company in, in Tel Aviv in Israel, which is now trying to charge through wireless underneath the road. As you drive over the road, your, your battery will be charged like your wireless, so you don't have to carry your big battery. And uh, so these are new jobs which you didn't know that are going to, that would be around five years ago. And they say that uh, in, 10, in 10 years time, there'll be jobs that we never dreamt of. So there's definitely going to be plenty of new jobs, but they, they may have to do, uh, invent those jobs because we don't even know what they're going to be in the future, but they'll definitely be related to, I think the energy sector, the transportation sector and the food sector, the uh, food technologies, um, how are we going to produce food more efficiently, more sustainable for, for the rest of the world? Um, the finance sector, that's also the banks and insurance agencies now are becoming aware of climate change. They're be coming on board. It's going to impact them greatly as well because of natural hazards and other things which have been insured, but they can also be part of the solution. So also developing new economic models for countries, uh, how to invest in the long. So definitely there'll be plenty of jobs, I think. Um, but I think the younger generation is already on board. They're really very involved at the moment. Thank you. Um, Menachem, um, can I ask you to unmute? I think you were the first one for the question. Well, uh, yes, I have unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good. Uh, my question relates to electricity supply, uh, because the affordable renewables at the moment are wind and solar. Both have a fluctuating supply for the seasons. And at present, the fluctuation is made up using gas turbines, which are fossil fuel devices. And my understanding is that at this point in time, we can achieve perhaps 40% renewables. If you go much above that, the whole electricity supply becomes unstable. I just wonder if you have a vision of how we get beyond this point. Obviously, it's a question of storage, but what sort of storage we're going to use yeah. and how we're going to do it. 
Yeah, so it's very interesting. Just on the news and in, in the TV in Israel here, just before I came on, uh, they, they were showing a new startup company in Israel, <clears throat> which is trying to solve this problem of storage. So storage is a big problem because, as you know, the sun only shines during the day, and the wind doesn't blow all the time, and we need electricity all the time, and uh, it's, so it's not easy to to run an electricity company and, or your home if you're only getting power half of the day. So storage is a big issue. So this company. Firstly, so storage, basically people think of batteries, but batteries is a problem because lithium batteries are also polluting when they end their lifetime, what do you do with it? Lithium is a resource. So the first thing people are talking about is hydrogen again. So hydrogen is a, a fuel which will be developed and can be de developed say in the middle of the day when we have a lot of solar, but we don't have a, a, a huge load from the public. They're not requesting a lot of energy. So actually when we have the peak in the solar, we don't have the, the peak demand by the public. And so you can use this to produce hydrogen, which can be stored then in tanks and can be used at nighttime. But this Israeli company has got a new idea, which is uh, quite interesting, where they're basically producing compressed air. Like you can think of it as like a scuba diving tank, but big one. And they're basically using water, water and air. So basically solar or wind during the day uh, pumps water into a closed a big container underground, which has got air in it. So you basically, the water being pumped in is basically compressing that air and you're using solar energy for that. And then at nighttime, when you don't have the sun, you just, the compressed air just pushes the water out and it, run, it turns a turbine. So you basically, at nighttime, you've got uh, energy from which you've stored up during the day. And there are no chemicals, no lithium, it's just water and air. And this is working. They have a pilot now in the Arava, which is working. And this may be the future of how we have uh, storage for solar and wind during the nighttime to give us a steady supply of energy 24 hours a day. Thank you. Um, jo Thank Joanna, you. Um, Joanna, could you unmute? Thank you. Did I, did I do that? Yeah, yes. yes, you have. Okay, okay. Um, well, thank you so much. It was just incredibly fascinating lecture. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask uh, one silly question. I'm not a scientist, I'm an artist actually, but at 2011 in July, I was on Svalbard for a couple of weeks on uh, Spitsbergen. And I was told at the time that it was the first year ever that um, the fjords between the uh, Svalbard archipelago islands did not freeze, which obviously started to cause problems for, for the living animals and, and uh, wildlife there. Now, um, I must admit that I just fell in love in Svalbard. <laughs> and um, do you have any data what is happening there? Well, firstly, it's, it's, firstly, there are no, no silly questions. Um, and it, there was definitely, it's, it's, uh, I mean, this is, I mentioned it with the, the sea ice in the Arctic and Svalbard, that's up in the Arctic, uh, Svalbard. So definitely things are warming much faster up there than anywhere else in the world. And we're seeing this also uh, that, uh, for example, the, the ocean passages across uh, Canada from the Pacific to the Atlantic have opened up in the last few years. Ships can go in the summer from the Pacific to the Atlantic uh, across northern Canada, which they couldn't do ever before because it was frozen in the summer too. And this has opened up now new trading routes, which is impacting, say, the Panama Canal. You don't have to go through the Panama Canal anymore. And it's also opening up places where you can start drilling oil and there's competition between Russia and Norway and Canada, who owns that land, which could cause even more problems. But Svalbard and all those places are all basically in the same basket. They're all in the same region, which is warming much faster than the rest of the planet. So it's going to continue there. There's going to be less ice and snow up there. And definitely it has impact on, on wildlife. Uh, they're basically the polar bears also. They use the frozen ice on the sea to walk out to go fishing and, and getting their food. And so without that, they're limited to where they can actually look for food. And, um, and this is causing problems with... Uh, the, the populations in certain places in the Arctic. So I'm not sure about Svalbard, but I'm sure it's the same happening everywhere around the Arctic. 
Okay. So it'll continue that trend into the future, unfortunately. For some, it may be good, less with the fjords joining, but generally it is more bad than good. Um, thank you. I've got a, a question from uh, Sue and David Gabriel um, about desalination. Because obviously water is a key resort and Israel is as focused as anybody on it. But the, the question is whether uh, uh, there's renewable energy being used for that. So at the moment, not. Uh, and it is heavy in energy use to produce desalinized water. But the dream eventually would be to use uh, solar, or in Israel at least, we don't have much wind. Solar, we have plenty. And uh, you may have heard recently of the agreement with Jordan that uh, we, we've just signed an agreement just a week or two ago with Jordan that Jordan is going to uh, build solar farms for Israel. So we'll get solar energy from Israel. And in return, we'll give them desalinated water because they don't have any water there. So the energy that we can get from Jordan can be used to produce water for the Jordanians and having this dependence of one side depending on the other one and the trust between the two sides can also influence the stability hopefully in the region and geopolitics in the region. So some of these climate solutions in the region can actually also have other positive effects by producing more collaboration and, and stability here. But at the Thank moment, you. we're not using renewables for that, but that would be the goal eventually. Um, but Israel was, I remember when I first went to Israel, and that was a long time ago, uh, being so impressed with the hot water, uh, the solar-powered hot water that was sat on top of all the flats in those days, because uh, right. so much radi solar radiation. So the interesting thing is, as you say, we're, we're living in, in uh, 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 equivalent to the Hudson Bay, I think. We're about a part of the UK is as far north as that. And there's a lot less solar energy, and yet solar energy, there are solar farms now in the UK. But in Israel, it must be significantly more productive. Right. right. But you have lots of wind in the North yeah, Sea. Yeah, we, we've got the I best mean, wind resource in Europe. Yeah. yeah. So, so obviously, your main renewable source will be wind in the future. It is at the moment, but you can go more and more and get more wind. Uh, but that also is not always stable, so it has to be stored Absolutely. somehow. Yeah. And the worst thing is when you get a really cold winter, which we sometimes do with sort of clear skies and no wind. <laughs> uh, we've got right. all sorts of challenges. Um, I think we've sort of come to the end of, of the time we'd allotted. I mean, thank you so much. It's really be really fascinating, beautifully presented and thank really you. engaging and thank you very much indeed and I, I hope we can meet you sometime not just on zoom thank you it was my pleasure i'm glad you enjoyed it and uh, if you have any more questions you can contact me by email we have thank, to you. thank you very much um, and uh, uh, if i could just by way of a plug as we go we've got the um uh, uh we've got the holocaust memorial just the the holocaust memorial um uh, uh we're not quite sure it's likely to be a zoom this year depending on covid uh, we usually do quite a lot about that uh, in richmond but uh, i think that i think that's what you wanted me irina just to sort of leave a plug but thank you very much thank you very much professor welcome thank you it's thank absolutely you. fascinating and inspiring yeah and i wish i can Unmute everyone so that we can give you a round of applause. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much so and good night to you all. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good evening. Thank you for your time. And thanks everyone for joining. And hopefully see you on the 30th of January for our Holocaust Memorial Day. Thank you, Leonard, for sharing. It was thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye.